so Stephen Mosher will be our first panelist uh, and speaker. He is an internationally acclaimed um, expert on China and population issues. Uh, beginning in 1979, and a trip to China um, as a sociologist, uh, had the opportunity to um, study what was going on there. Uh, went there as a uh, as a pro-choice atheist, and witnessed uh, the government forced uh, induced abortions, and, um, and from that experience, uh, converted to uh, pro practicing pro-life Catholic. And uh, he's testified before Congress. Uh, he's been on numerous uh, television broadcasts and, um, and as an author. And uh, we'd like to welcome Stephen Mosher to the uh, Well, thank you all for coming, and, and, and thank you to my fellow panelists for allowing me to go first. And I, uh, it was either let me go first or I would try to find my locate, and I think going first is by far the better option since I've never mastered the other. Um, this panel is on how the culture undermines life and family, and uh, I'm a last minute addition to this panel, because what I'd like to talk about just for a few minutes, and I won't take up very much time, is how uh, Planned Parenthood, uh, the, the, specifically the Planned Parenthood Federation of America, undermines life and family overseas. And we all know the evil that it does in the United States. We all know about uh, the organs, and the, I, I won't even go into that because we're all familiar with the videos, which are difficult to watch and, and even difficult to remember. But but uh, you all need to know that part of the half billion dollars that Planned Parenthood Federation of America gets picks from our pockets goes overseas to do things that are equally evil. About $38 million the last time I checked went overseas. Uh, the first time I became aware of this was way back in 1979. I was in China, and uh, I was in China at the beginning of the one-child policy, and I saw women arrested for the crime of being pregnant and uh, forcibly aborted at seven, eight, nine months. I'm aware of cases of infanticide where illegal babies, illegal in the eyes of the state, not in the eyes of their parents, were killed at birth. So forced abortion, forced sterilization, forced contraception, and infanticide. Uh, was, it has been part of daily life in China now for the last 30, 35 years. Mm -hmm. But I also became aware at the time that uh, International Planned Parenthood mm -hmm. Federation and the Planned Parenthood Federation of America was a big cheerleader for China's uh, one-child policy. In fact, uh, the International Planned Parenthood Federation has been financially supporting China's one-child policy from the beginning, along with the United Nations Population Fund, which gave China $50 million in 1979. IPPF shipped in another million. Not a large amount of money, but it wasn't the money that was really the issue. The, the issue was the imprimatur that this, this, uh, this internationally renowned organization gave to China's one-child policy. The implicit, uh, uh, the, the implicit Im implication here that, uh, that what China was doing in terms of forcing down its birth rate and even forcing women to have abortion was all right in the eyes of the international community. Now, some of that $1 million, I have no doubt, came from American taxpayers through the Planned Parenthood Federation of America, uh, and perhaps directly. Uh, but going on through the years, Planned Parenthood Federation of America has been very active overseas, directly, not through IDPF, but directly sending money overseas to support various front groups. Uh, we have seen their activity up close and personal in, in every continent. Um, we have an office in, in Lima, Peru, where we are constantly fighting in Latin America groups that front groups that are set up by the Planned Parenthood Federation of America, entirely funded by PPFA, and are busy lobbying for the legalization of abortion, performing in some cases illegal abortion, setting up abortion hotlines, um, engaging in other activities that are illegal under, under the laws of various Latin American countries. And this brings me to my point. What we are now trying to do in working with, uh, working with ADF is to devise a legal strategy to take uh, these, make these people in Latin America the front groups for Planned Parenthood Federation of America and EPFA itself. Uh, the subject of congressional investigations in countries like Peru and Ecuador and Honduras and Nicaragua and so forth. And also the subject of legal action because these groups are surely breaking a number of laws. Right? They're they, they are, in some cases, uh, um, lobbying illegally without having registered as lobbyists under the laws of the country that they're operating in. Uh, they are performing, advocating the performance of abortions, illegal chemical and sometimes surgical abortions. Uh, heck, they may be even engaging in tax evasion. Uh, 
that was enough to convict Al Capone, it should be enough to convict some of these guys. So that's what we're going after them overseas. Now, they've been doing this for 30 years. Why now? Well, just asking the question uh, you know, makes it, makes, it, makes it clear why uh, now is the time to strike, because there is so much pressure bring, but, bring, but, bring brought to bear on Planned Parenthood Federation of America in, in, in the United States uh, through the U.S. Congress and through the media that we want to duplicate that effort overseas. And what we see happening, what we hope will happen, is that when a congressional investigation is launched in Ecuador uh, against Planned Parenthood Federation of America's activities in Ecuador, that information will reach the U.S. Congress, and it'll be brought up in congressional hearings here. And when Peru or Honduras or the activities of PPFA is mentioned in the congressional investigation in Washington, D.C., it'll be mentioned down in, it'll be front page news in Peru and Ecuador and those countries. So that's the, the, the strategy. I think now is the time. Any, any of you who are involved in the, uh, the effort, I'm sure that most of you are in some, in some respects, <coughs> to defund Planned Parenthood and delegitimize this organization, uh, now is the time to move forward as, as forcefully as we can. And now, I will bid you adieu. <laughs> Steve with us uh, in, in his attempt to be at two places at one time. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, our, next, our next speaker will be Peter Sprigg. Uh, Peter Sprigg is the Senior Fellow for Policy Studies at the Family Research Council in Washington, D.C. Um, as, a, as a fellow Baptist, it's nice to have another ordained Baptist minister here with us, um, having served at the Clif Clifton Park Center Baptist Church in Clifton Park, New York. Um, he also holds a Master of Divinity from Gordon-Conwell Theological Seminary and a Bachelor of Arts from Drew University. And so we welcome Peter Spring. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you all for being here this afternoon. I felt led to share uh, what you might call a big picture presentation with you this afternoon. Uh, I call it Family Values Made Simple. Uh, the downside is that you probably won't learn anything that you didn't already know. But I hope that the upside will be hearing the message in a different and very concise way. Some critics of the pro-family movement argue that our policy positions support some families, but not all families in their various alternate forms. Sometimes even allies of our movement are confused about what uh, what unites the various issues that we address. What, for example, do abortion, marriage, homosexuality, parenting, and abstinence education have to do with each other? What holds these issues together as a pro-family agenda? I think the unifying concept is family formation. Not just any group of people who live together or who care about one another is a family. There is a natural and normative way in which families are formed. I will outline nine principles, nine steps which should be followed to form families, ideally. Not only should you follow these nine steps, but they should be undertaken in this specific chronological order. After each, I will then address the topic <coughs> of this session, which is how the culture undermines these principles. <laughs> so if you want to take notes, it should be very easy. You will need exactly nine lines in your notebook, or maybe ten. Um, let's get started. Principle number one for family formation is find a partner of the opposite sex. <laughs> Men and women complement one another anatomically for the purposes of sexual intercourse. They complement one another functionally for the purpose of reproduction and they complement one another psychologically and socially as well. The culture undermines this principle by saying that one could just as usefully choose a partner of the same sex. Now, this is not, strictly speaking, an issue of homosexuality, although it encompasses that. The larger issue is one of gender complementarity. The culture also undermines this principle by denying that there are any essential differences between the sexes at all. So principle number one is find a partner of the opposite sex. Principle number two is get married. 
Research shows that getting and remaining married gives multiple advantages to women, to men, to their children, uh, to the couples as a unit, even when you control for other factors such as education and economic status. The culture undermines this principle, however, when it dismisses marriage as just a piece of paper. Ironically, in the United States at least, most in the upper classes continue to marry. It is the lower classes who have internalized this message and now fail to marry. As someone has said, we need our intellectual elites to preach what they practice. So principle number two is get married. Principle number three is move in together. And married couples don't have to be persuaded to do this, but here is where the order of the nine steps becomes important. Uh, the culture undermines family formation when it accepts cohabitation before marriage as, or as a substitute for marriage. Some people even encourage cohabitation as a sort of trial marriage, like test driving a car, in the belief that it will lead to stronger marriages. But research clearly shows that people who cohabit before marrying are more likely to get divorced, not less. So principle number three, move in together only after getting married. Principle number four is have sex only with your spouse. It is a myth that conservatives hate sex. But again, the order is important. Marriage first, then sex. Research shows that married people have sex more often and enjoy it more than unmarried people. The culture undermines this principle, however, when it says that sex is acceptable for anyone from puberty onward, regardless of whether they are married or not. Society pays the price in the form of sexually transmitted diseases, unplanned pregnancies, often resulting in abortions for single-parent homes, and a string of broken hearts. Once again, principle number four, have sex only with your spouse. Principle number five is conceive a child. To be pro-family is to be pro-natal. Fertility is not a disease, and a child is a blessing, not a burden. Society needs children if it is to have any future at all. Yet the culture undermines this principle when it glamorizes the childless life and discourages the self-sacrifice of parenthood. This is one principle that has an alternative, adoption. We should celebrate when a husband and wife open their homes and their hearts to an adoptive child whose biological parents did not or could not fulfill all these nine principles. So principle number five is conceive or adopt a child. Principle number six is bear the child that is conceived. We know that a distinct new human being is created at the moment of conception, and that child has a fundamental right to life. We recognize the unique sacrifice that every mother makes in carrying a child to term, and we are ready to help her meet the challenges involved. But the culture undermines this principle when it allows a woman to choose death for her child and protects the doctor who kills it. Abortion devalues human life, and it hurts women. So principle number six is bear the child that is conceived. Principle number seven is repeat steps four through six as desired. <laughs> Have sex, conceive children, and bear children. Each new child enriches a family's life. Each new child is a potential source of wisdom and producer of wealth for society. The culture undermines this principle, however, when it allows a misguided fear of overpopulation to discourage childbearing. The greater threat is depopulation, as the, demogra the demographic bomb renders social insurance programs unsustainable and weakens economic growth. So once again, principle number seven is to repeat steps four through six, have sex, conceive children, and bear children. Principle number eight is raise your children together. An article by two researchers who are not pro-family conservatives recently acknowledged, quote, most scholars now agree that children raised by two biological parents, necessarily a mother and father, uh, in a stable marriage 
do better than children in other family forms across a wide range of outcomes, close quote. The culture undermines this principle when it tells society that having two mothers or two fathers is just as good, and that children of single or divorced parents suffer no harm because of how resilient children are. So principle number eight is mom and dad raise your children together. Principle number nine is remain married until one of you dies. Cohabitation is living together, but marriage is making a life together, a whole life. The culture undermines that principle by saying that marriage should only be as long as your <coughs> love lasts. But research shows that most unhappy marriages can be saved, and that divorce is not good for women, not good for men, and certainly not good for children. We must remember the admonition by Dietrich Bonhoeffer, it is not your love that sustains the marriage, but from now on, the marriage that sustains your love. Those are the nine principles of family formation. Family values made simple. But I might add a tenth principle, which is not family specific. It is worship God. Research by my colleague uh, at Family Research Council, Pat Fagan, confirms over and over again that the intact family led by a married mother and father has the best outcomes of any family structure. But the intact family that worships God at least weekly has the best outcomes of all. The culture undermines this principle by mocking religion as a delusion at best or a source of oppression at worst. I am not a Mormon, as you heard, I'm a Baptist minister, but I am constantly struck when I see state-by-state -state rankings that always seem to show Utah at the top of the list for family and social health. Frankly, Utah puts the so-called Bible Belt to shame. It's not the salt air, it's obedience to the tenth of these family values. Now. I am sure that many of us in this room, there are many of us in this room who have not followed all nine or ten of these principles for our whole life, or who did one or more of them out of order. My message is not one of condemnation, but of aspiration. Repentance, forgiveness, and a return to the right path are always possible. Family values, however, are not a disjointed set of maxims stitched together. They represent a seamless garment of family formation that advances the health and well-being of us all. Thank you. Our next panelist is Robert Knight. Uh, he's a senior fellow and policy expert for the American Civil Rights Union. Uh, he was a journalist for 15 years, uh, including seven as an editor and writer with the Los Angeles Times. He has a weekly column for the Washington Times, holds a BA and MA in political science from American University, and prior to his time at the American Civil Rights Union, um, he also uh, held positions at the Hoover Institution, the Heritage Foundation, Family Research Council, Concerned Women for America, Media Research Center, and Coral Ridge Ministries. Minutes of <laughs> Not to worry. Reminds me of the uh, Baptist pastor who was invited into the pulpit of a neighboring Episcopal church. And uh, when he got up there, he said, uh, Now I know you people are used to short sermons, but I, I must, I think it's only fair to tell you that I tend to go on for about 45 minutes. And one of the deacons got up and said, That's okay, pastor. We think it's only fair to let you know we stopped listening after 15. <laughs> so I hope that won't be a problem for you. <laughs> now, if we're wondering how America and Western Europe went from marriage-centered societies to post-Christian sexual anarchy, abetted by massive government growth and enforced by political correctness in just a few decades, let's say it's no accident. I'm going to blame it on the Muppets. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. But the new Muppet show is pretty bad. We stopped taping it. 
we thought, and we had high hopes for it, because we like the Muppets. But now they've gone adult humor, and they know kids are watching. And this is one of the problems with American culture, which is put all over the world. Uh, they destroy innocence by acquainting children with concepts they're not ready for. Their minds aren't developed enough. They don't have any moral conscience yet to appreciate uh, moral distinctions. Um, and the left knows this. That's why they try to destroy, get to the kids as soon as they can. The progressive left has been in a cultural and political death struggle with religion, the family, capitalism, and morality since the French Revolution. With the advent of Marxism in the mid-19th century, the battle intensified and the left expected the collapse of capitalism, but it didn't happen except in Russia, where there was a revolution in 1917. So they changed the strategy. To liberate people from free market capitalism, it became necessary to liberate people first from bourgeois morality, as Karl Marx put it. Italian communist Antonio Gramsci saw the strategic value of this as early as the 1920s, and he called on his fellow revolutionaries to capture the culture, that is, the institutions that transmit cultural values. Vladimir Lenin himself said, for us, cinema is the most important propaganda instrument. He saw that in the 1920s when movies were just black and white and gosh, they weren't on the, the screens weren't as big, the sound was not thunderous. Uh, he saw what was coming, that, hey, you can manipulate people. They're in a dark theater. All they can see is this. They have no opportunity to change the channel. Movies are powerful. Now, at the same time, scholars at the Frankfurt School, that, that was the Institute for Social Research at Goethe University in Frankfurt, Germany, spun out Marxist critiques of society before the Nazis drove them out to the West where many of them took up prominent posts in major universities in London and in the United States. Uh, later, Antonio Gramsci's call for capturing the culture was taken up by the German student movement leader, Rudi Deutsch. He advocated a long march through the institutions of power. Now, often Gramsci is uh, misquoted along those lines, but it was actually Rudi Deutsch. And the idea was to create radical change from within government and society. And the radicals did so, starting with the universities. Revolutionaries such as John Dewey, Margaret Mead, Margaret Sanger, Herbert Marcuse, and Wilhelm Reich all waxed poetically about the Soviet Union, inspired, inspiring progressive educational and social policies that we can support for organized religion and the family while we're empowering the state. I think C.S. Lewis uh, put it best when he said, the agenda of the left is to make pornography public and religion private. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're seeing in the United States and increasingly in Western Europe, where religious principles and religious people are being pushed out of the public square while the pornography and every sexual excess of every kind is being promoted. With the help of like-minded people in Hollywood, they've been hammering away at social conventions of all kinds. By the time the 1960s rolled around with the advent of the birth control pill, Playboy magazine, mass communications, Western civilization was ripe for takeover by an alien ideology of limitless sex in return for reduced economic, social, and intellectual freedom. Alfred C. Kinsey's fraudulent sex studies in the late 1940s and early 1950s provided the scientific foundation for the left's attack on morality, normalcy, marriage, and the family. As Kinsey biographer Dr. Judith Riesman has noted, Playboy founder Hugh Hefner was a straight-laced religious young man uh, and then got a hold of the Kinsey reports and he found a new god. Porn became his religion and he founded the Playboy empire which mainstreamed pornography <coughs> into not only the United States but into Europe. By the way, he recently announced Playboy would no longer feature naked women. <laughs> yeah, he said, well, it's, you know, we're past time. Uh, you can get it on the internet, so why are we selling this? But I don't believe it. I, I, this is like saying that football stadiums will no longer host football games. We're going to have bad mitten. Uh, it will still come. I, I don't think so. With all the articles. Pardon? With all the articles. That's right. Scintillating reading. <laughs> will probably last about as long as Larry Flint's uh, famous short-lived conversion to Christianity. He, he's, he was the publisher of Hustler magazine, which was even worse than Playboy. 
Now, this brings us to the current moment where shamelessness is rampant. The only thing frowned upon is disapproval, and even a lack of celebration of the latest form of sexual dysfunction. We're very deeply, more, very more deeply into the absurd. Uh, the late great writer M. Stanton Evans uh, said it really dawned on him uh, how crazy this was getting, and this was years ago. He was watching television, and he saw a, a guy interviewing another man, but the other man was wearing a dress and affecting a female persona. And they went on for a while about how great this was and how free that he was and so forth. And he said, you know, is there any downside to this? You know, you dressing as a woman? The guy said, well, there is this. You know, I never know when I'm going to get hit on by some weirdo. <laughs> now, just as many of us here worship God in words and music, the media, the left media, worship their gods in words, pictures, and songs. Now, the gods of uh, the media are money, sex, power, and self. And the bottom line really is worship of man. But everything's upside down in their world. In Genesis, the order of importance in life is God first, then life itself, family, and then sex. In the media world, it's just the opposite. Sex is their highest value. Family, if they care, and now they're redefining it. Life, uh, with the exception of unborn children. And finally, God, if at all. And it's usually a God of their own making. And of course, they know they're lying about all this. Uh, that's why I don't want to let them off the hook. Uh, Book of Romans uh, tells us that. Book of Romans in the New Testament. Romans 1.20 says, For the invisible things of him, that is God, from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his external power and Godhead, so that they're without excuse, because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful that became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Uh, what's right and wrong is in every human heart. God puts it in there, and we can ignore it at our own peril. And talk about vain, can you imagine a more vain place than Hollywood? Uh, did you know that Hollywood groups give themselves more than 1,500 awards annually? <laughs> <laughs> that doesn't count the Oscars and Emmys, and music folks, the uh, Grammys. It's, uh, and they're, they keep putting out movies that don't work, uh, that don't make money, and as Ted Bear, who some of you have heard from, uh, and does a wonderful job at Movie Guide, has chronicled the movies that with traditional moral values are the ones that make money. The ones that don't fail. Uh, here, I'll give you an example, a very uh, colorful example. The Chronicles of Narnia, the very first film, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, made $291 million, uh, which was the second highest grossing Christian themed movie ever, <coughs> next to The Passion of the Christ. Then they came out with the next one, Prince Caspian. That only made 141 million. Then they came out with The Voyage of the Dawn Treader, which is one of my son's favorite books, and uh, he panned the movie. And so did the, uh, the public. Uh, the, it, it, their take was uh, 104 million. Now what happened? The production values were still very high, but what happened was these movies were de-Christianized. They just became big, huge, expensive special effects, epics without a soul. And the public responded in kind. They didn't go. Uh, and Hollywood just keeps doing that. They spend a fortune on special effects. But if the story isn't there, and if the story does not reflect God's idea of right and wrong, so it stirs the human heart like nothing else, it will fail. All the, all the uh, production values in the world will make up for it. Now the good news is uh, Christian filmmakers are coming into their own. Uh, you know, the Kendrick brothers out of Georgia uh, have made a series of Christian movies. They're spending more uh, on the movies as they go along, and they're making more in the box office. You know, their, their first film is Flywheel. Yeah. It, <laughs> I think they shot it on a cell phone. <laughs> uh, then came Facing the Giants, in which they, you know, they upped it to a home movie camera. Uh, then they put out Fireproof, Courageous, and now War Room, which is still in the theaters. 
War Room has now made over $66 million. Uh, lots of uh, secular people are flocking to it uh, because it's so inspiring. And, you know, who knows how much they're going to spend on the next movie. All of these, they've spent a fraction of what Hollywood spends making movies. But the stories they tell are timeless. You know, fireproof, by the way. Uh, about a firefighter who has a troubled marriage and is patched up by God. And I'm just sorry I've spoiled it for you. <laughs> <laughs> that made $33 million. And I think the budget was under $3 million. Uh, you know, people want this stuff. Uh, poor Ted Bear must be uh, pulling his hair out because he presents these facts and figures to Hollywood every year and says, look, the uh, top 10 movies last year weren't R rated. They were less than R rated. Uh, virtually all the films that succeed have, have Christian, if they're not explicitly Christian values, at least they're basic moral values. Um, and Hollywood doesn't seem to want to listen. But, uh, you know, it, it's uh, part of the reason is, and Michael Medved told me this once. Michael was a film critic, I guess he still is, and he has a talk show, uh, radio talk show in Seattle. He's, I, I said, why do they ignore the box office? And he said, look, it's so easy to make money in Hollywood. These people are guilty because they're making so much money so easily, having fun doing it. And they look out and they think, gee, um, I owe something back. Uh, and since they've rejected God, they join every left-wing cause under the sun, from climate change to uh, animal rights. Uh, they feel that, that deep down, that guilt, that I ought to be doing something purposeful in this life. That's why you see Hollywood at the forefront of so many causes uh, that have nothing to do with God. Now finally, just to leave you some hope, uh, Alan Carlson provided some hope this morning in the plenary session when he said he thinks we're on the cusp of a renaissance in appreciation for marriage and families. Uh, looking over a couple hundred years, he said, you know, it's time. And you can do this amid the rubble. If we're standing amid the rubble, we can't really see what's right in front of us. Um, but people like Alan Carlson can. Uh, <laughs> partly because he's looked back and seen uh, beyond the rubble back there. Uh, millions of people still believe in God. Millions of people still have in their hearts what the late Russell Kirk called the mystic chords of memory. Uh, and when you tap those, uh, you are a su success in the culture. Uh, and finally, I'll leave you with one <coughs> brief story, and that's when I was at Family Research Council, uh, before Peter came. And we were sitting there, glumly watching footage of a gay pride parade. And it was the portion of the parade in which the Sisters of Perpetual <coughs> Violence, uh, those are the men who dress as nuns, and these poor guys are so mixed up, and they put weird makeup on, and they had blasphemous signs about God and Jesus Christ. And we're sitting there, so some of the people are tearing up, like saying, this is terrible. And my friend Bob Morrison was standing behind us, and I look back, yeah, I figure he's upset, and he's standing there grinning. <laughs> what is the matter with you? And he says, don't you get it? They can smear him, they can blaspheme him, they can even spit on him, but they cannot ignore him because of who he is. I'm going to leave you with that. Thank you very much. The last panelist is uh, Dr. Peggy Hartshorn. She is the president of Heartbeat International and has been serving in that role since 1993. And uh, under her leadership, uh, Heartbeat has grown from uh, 250 members to become the largest and most expansive network of Christ-centered, life-affirming pregnancy help centers around the world. And, uh, and so we're grateful for uh, what you are doing. And she has a PowerPoint, and I have closed her laptop, so I'm going to allow her to come up and uh, help her get this. Oh, that's all right. Andrew is watching. Did you watch it? And now my new password is so difficult. Let's see if I can get it. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
of what to do. I can remember. Get it up on the screen. Yeah. Okay. Good. 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 Thank you. Okay. Let's see. Huh. That's funny. Give a shoe. My day. Shoe. Start it. Well, that's an interesting lesson. Let's see what that tells us. Ah, there you go. Okay. Well, thank you. Let's thank welcome you. Dr. Thank you. Thank you. thank you all for being here. And I have no idea why they put me on this panel. Because uh, I, I have these brains over here uh, who, Robert and Peter, who have done all this research, who truly understand. Uh, the, the the causes, and uh, you heard some of that uh, from Robert, the causes from the beginning of the 20th century in terms of Marxism, communism, you know, the sexual revolution that's gotten us to the place that we are today. And, and what a wonderful list of 10 steps in the right order that we need to have uh, to, to really <coughs> get back to where we should be you know, with marriage and the family. And um, I think, I'm not sure exactly why they put me on here, but my thought is that um, what we are doing in pregnancy health centers, and you heard that, that Heartbeat is a, a, the world's largest network of pregnancy health, where 2,000 locations in 50 countries, uh, people who are really dealing with, actually, the, the, the services that we provide, which are volunteer-based, community-based, geared to helping those struggling with unplanned or unintended pregnancies. Our services are what we call intervention for people who are involved in the crisis of an un unplanned or unintended pregnancy and think that, they, uh, that abortion would be a good alternative. We're involved in preventing those pregnancies from occurring in the first place. Um, and we're involved in healing the wounds and reconciling those who have had these kinds of crisis pregnancies and have chosen abortion and uh, are, we are motivated by biblical values, faith in Christ and or humanism, uh, humanitarianism I should say. Uh, why are we, why are we doing these things? We grew up in the late 60s, the earliest pregnancy centers were started in the United States in the late 60s uh, because of the trend we saw going toward legalizing abortion, and our founders had been involved in a series of marriage and family seminars and lectures uh, in, in uh, I believe, was St. John's University in Minnesota. Uh, very far-sighted people saw in, in the 60s, and you can see why when you mention Hugh Hefner and the sexual revolution and the uh, Kinsey studies. These people saw that this was going to be tremendously destructive of marriage and family and would lead right from contraceptive to abortion. Uh, and what that meant for the concept of our human sexuality and particularly intimacy between man and woman and childbearing and so forth, they knew that we would be dealing with, sorry for that, but we would be dealing with very quickly, which we were, the survivors of the sexual and cultural revolution. Uh, they knew that in the 60s. Today, we are dealing with thousands and thousands and thousands of people who have bought into these ideas, have gotten all this out of order uh, that, that Peter told us. If they were following all those 10 principles, they wouldn't be in our pregnancy centers. And so we are dealing with the results. Our founders knew that when people bought into these ideas, they would need a safety net. They need some place to go. But what they thought was, we'll catch them in the crisis. You know what crisis intervention counseling is. You get someone in the crisis, you get them on your feet, their feet, and then you send them off again. Well, guess what? Over the last 50 some years, we can't just get them on their feet and send them off again because they are so wounded by getting all these things out of order and uh, buying into 
of the ideas that have been promoted uh, in the media and the uh, movies and so forth and so on. So, um, my expertise in the uh, effects of this cultural revolution is really in dealing with the victims of it. And uh, we got involved simply because, of, and I was involved in the early 70s, that we thought we could help people in the crisis. Now we realize, as I mentioned on the previous slide, we not only need to get them in the crisis, we need to help prevent them from being in the crisis in the first place. And for those who come to us severely wounded, and many of them do, multiple sexual partners, uh, sexual abuse, um, and, and neglect, uh, abortions, all of that needs to be healed. Otherwise, these people can never actually engage in a healthy uh, marriage relationship and healthy parenting situations. So we've got our, um, we have our task cut out for us, of course. Uh, from, from then, the 60s, when the sexual revolution really got, start, got going quickly in the United States, although the groundwork was laid long before that, but you can see some of the differences. 40.6% of pregnancies in the USA in 2013 were to unmarried women, compared to only 7.7% in 1965. So, uh, birth control, for instance, when people say, well, what, we, we have all these abortions because people don't have enough birth control. They don't have access to birth control. Well, guess what? I believe it was in 1967 that the federal government first started funding what they call Title X, free contraceptives for everybody. And according to that uh, law that was passed, it was because we need to preserve families. And we need to make sure we don't have unplanned pregnancies and children born uh, out of wedlock who won't have a chance in this world. Well, you've heard throughout this conference what's happened you know, to, uh, to children today. Uh, if they're raised in a two-parent home, they have a really good opportunity. But that's not happening, although we've spent millions and millions of dollars on contraceptive, state-paid abortions, and so forth and so on. So here's some of the results that we're dealing with in pregnancy centers. Numbers of known sexually transmitted diseases in the 60s, syphilis and gonorrhea in the United States. We now have 25 different types of sexually transmitted diseases, but you'll read in various uh, studies that with all of the variations of the different diseases, some people even say we have 70, 80, 90 different types of sexually transmitted diseases today. Most of the girls coming into pregnancy centers today have one or more sexually transmitted disease already. Ratio of marriage of to divorce, uh, back in the 60s you can see 9.7 to 2.6, now 6.8 to 3.6. Uh, and we have also 55 million abortions in the USA since 1973. So again, the prevention by giving people contraceptives has not worked. <coughs> uh, they bought into these ideas and it has created more and more of a problem. Now, <clears throat> someone asked me a question in one of the panels. Um, what do we, can we put the genie back in the bottle? <laughs> can we go back and take all of those uh, 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 Playboy magazines and, and all of the pornography and pretend like it never existed? No, we can't. Uh, so what we do in pregnancy centers is we provide for every girl who comes to us, every girl or woman, sometimes they're coming with their boyfriends, we provide an alternate. We provide an alternate in terms of vision and value. And we extend to them help and support to make a drastic change in their life. By doing what we do, and if you think of, of pregnancy help centers, you may say, well, they help babies, or they help babies be born. They save babies. Yes, we do. But in the process of that, we're also trying to give their mothers, their fathers, and their families a chance for a whole different vision and an opportunity to change. You know that old, um, I think you've probably heard that the uh, symbol for uh, crisis in Chinese, the Chinese symbol, also is the same symbol they use for opportunity. Uh, so that's the way we like to think of our work. By doing simply doing what we do, we are transformational for the culture. Um, we come in many different shapes and sizes. In the United States, there are 2,500 now pregnancy help centers, resource centers, and about half of them are medical clinics with ultrasound. Uh, over around the world, uh, there are a total of about 5,600 sites. These that are on the slide are actual affiliates of Heartbeat International. 
in 50 other countries as well as the United States. We have relationships with, with we try to help different regions of the world form their own kind of mini heartbeats. And, and then we work with them to create greater networks in their, in their country. For instance, there's one in South Africa. There's one now covering uh, the rest of Africa as well. So um, we, we work on uh, um, basically taking people who God has already called, organizations that are already in existence, trying to give them more vision and uh, standing beside them. Various methods you can see that we use in pregnancy centers. Um, we have hotlines, we have ultrasounds, uh, we do material aid. Um, silent voices, is, this is a sign actually from Africa. You can see that they do all of what we do in a very small uh, uh, town, actually would be considered a small town for us in Africa. Um, uh, ethnic ethnically diverse, our pregnancy health community is ethnically diverse. Uh, we're all over the world in the U.S. We have tried, like Planned Parenthood, uh, following up from Planned Parenthood to target uh, inner cities, um, uh, minority neighborhoods where Planned Parenthood also is, uh, is, has established themselves. <coughs> and this I want to go through somewhat quickly with you. While you think of our mission as saving babies, by saving babies, uh, yes, we do save babies, um, particularly uh, when women are abortion vulnerable, which is most of our clients, actually. Um, obviously, they are the most powerful example of a positive outcome. Ultrasound helps us do this even during the pregnancy. But the baby also helps transform the woman. So that we do more than save babies, we save women as well. We change lives in a life-changing way. Helping, having the baby establishes the very nature of the woman and her role in procreation. This is a vision that we're very uh, strongly represent in our centers. Um, many babies, or many mothers do say, my baby saved me. Uh, I was on a downward spiral and my baby saved me. So saving babies, we also help again teach women about their motherhood. We also help create families. Um, the mother and the baby are the simplest definition of family. Uh, but the birth of a baby creates more likelihood that the father and mother may get married and form a nuclear family. Actually, research shows that the, the, the time that the father of the child is most interested in fathering and parenting is at the time of the birth of the baby. So as we try to get more and more fathers involved, we're trying to see if marriage is a good option for some of our clients at least. This group actually, I was with them in Washington, D.C. I'll talk about our babies go to Congress in a minute. But, um, but we take moms and babies and pregnancy center directors to Congress at least once a year, usually twice, to say pregnancy help centers are good for America. This family, uh, this little girl, uh, she still looks little. She got pregnant at age 15. Her boyfriend, now her husband, was 17. Uh, they were, uh, they were, uh, went to Planned Parenthood, decided at the last minute to change their minds. Uh, there was a pregnancy center down the street. They actually went to the pregnancy center, continued the pregnancy. Two years later, they got married. Uh, and now here are their two daughters. The reason we got back in touch with them was actually, this little girl is in the eighth grade. And uh, in her school, they asked them to choose a volunteer project. She decided to raise money in a baby bottle campaign for the local pregnancy center because she knew that uh, without that pregnancy center, she might not have been born. So uh, there is always hope. <laughs> Um, so the baby, the mother, uh, have an, we have an opportunity to create an extended family, potentially grandparents, aunts, uncles, and everybody. The family represents a lineage, a component that creates the community. And as we know, without families, we don't have communities. And so we are in the work of creating and rebuilding the family through the work of the Pregnancy Center. Um, more impact. Uh, in addition to the actual families that we help form within the pregnancy centers, uh, we help the people who are part of the organizations. We call them the pregnancy help community. Um, to be life-minded in other aspects of their lives, to understand the broader and deeper aspects of the sanctity of life, to champion pro-life values among their family and friends, to use the skills that they use in the pregnancy center with anyone they know with an unplanned pregnancy. So how many of you have ever volunteered or worked at a pregnancy center? Okay, a few of you. Most volunteers who come in for training say, I just wanna, I just wanna help women, or I just wanna help save a baby. 
all right, when they actually get involved in the work, they, they are transformed. Their understanding of what the sanctity of human life means is totally changed. They can champion uh, life with their families and friends in their churches and communities, and I'll show you a little more of that uh, as we go along, too. <coughs> Many of our volunteers and people involved in the pregnancy help community have gotten onto their school boards, into politics, and so forth and so on. And let's remember this. Populations with strong pro-life values have higher birth rates than pro-abortion ones and can eventually create a positive social and political force. And that may be what Alan Carlson is uh, referring to today as well. Now, when we take our moms and babies to Congress, uh, we ask each pregnancy center there to have a, a sheet ready to share with their congressman uh, what impact does our pregnancy center have in your community? Because the congressmen usually think, and congressmen, well, why are you here? Do you want funding? What do you want me to do for you? We say, we want to show you simply that good work is being done in your community at no cost to the taxpayers. We are helping. Uh, we're part of the solution, not part of the problem. In this particular <coughs> pregnancy center, I love this, they got involved in a task force in their community to uh, hit the, um, the 10 red flags agreed upon in their community. What are the problems in our community? Child abuse and neglect, communicable diseases, what about sexually transmitted ones, for instance, domestic violence, homeless children and adolescents, childhood nutrition, smoking during pregnancy, single parents in financial distress, children in poverty. Doesn't that sound like all the problems we deal with in our pregnancy centers? Yes, all the 10 flags that this community had, had uh, hit on were the problems we are seeing and we're part of the solution in our pregnancy centers. And it was very smart of this pregnancy center to get part of that task force and say, we are here to actually tackle the same problems that all of you are concerned about, but the real answer is not more funding for these things. The real answer is let's get people involved with the people who need help, and let's provide and model, give them the uh, help and support they need to change their lives. So that's what we do. Um, they were identifying some of their some of their problems or some of their programs here. Another way of, of of identifying the impact of pregnancy centers. Oh, we do it on time. I need to finish here. Is that the pregnancy center in a community? And this happens overseas or in any community here in the United States. Yes, you think our main contact is with women and men in need, but a good pregnancy center connects to the media, the business community, the churches the legislators, the medical community, particularly if they have ultrasound, social services because they get their clients involved with social service care, the schools because they're speaking there about absence and sexual integrity. They are actually a tremendous, uh, influential, impactful organization in the community to rebuild the family. So that is a fi final impact, of course, impacting eternity by helping more lives to be born, serving in the name of Jesus, uh, modeling Jesus to others, speaking life and life everlasting, and uh, calling those who would hear to connect with the body of Christ in a closer way. So we are impacting life and impacting life uh, internationally. Heartbeat, uh, this is what we do to stand and help and support the growth of pregnancy centers all over the world. Uh, we are the teaching, training, networking, Heartbeat Central. Um, and we believe we're better together. So um, that, is, that is my contribution, that all of these horrible statistics, the effects, what we've heard at this conference, ordinary people, at no cost to the taxpayers, in every community, any place around the world can have this kind of an impact to help rebuild our families. Thank you.